Hello friends, I wanted to take a moment to share with you a little bit of wisdom that the Lord um, had shared with me recently uh, through his word, through prayer, and um, getting into that place of intimate worship in the word and trying to dial down and be quiet and um, don't want to make it long, so we'll just dive right into this. Uh, I was doing the daily Bible once again. I encourage everybody to get the daily Bible because it's like a full course meal, right? You can just go through the entire word and just the Lord will just continue to highlight things. We call it hidden manna, like hidden treasure. When you get in the word, he'll enlighten things. He'll highlight things to you. You might read something again and again, and it will give you something new, a greater revelation. So right now, I just wanted to share with you as I was reading through numbers in the daily Bible um, this week, there was the extensive, extensive detailed description of how to uh, set up the temple and who was to work in it and the rituals that were required um, in order to cleanse the utensils, cleanse your garments, cleanse your body, um, prepare the, the offerings, burnt offerings, sacrifice offerings, uh, fellowship offerings, wave offerings. And it's just so incredibly detailed. And it's like, my goodness, I would be in so much trouble if I had to like try to figure out how to go before the Lord with all these offerings, guilt offerings, um, fellowship offerings. Like there's just so much in God's word. It's so detailed. It's just a bit overwhelming. But the one that jumped out to me recently was Numbers 15. And they were talking about the offerings for um, unintentional sin. And there were various offerings for unintentional sin. And um, they go through all these details on what to do if there's unintentional sin. Okay, different types of unintentional sin, right? So um, touching a dead body by accident or killing somebody by accident or someone didn't know the law and they broke the law by accident. It wasn't willful. Okay, there were, there were offerings that could be made where these people would be forgiven, and um, but it cost them. They were guilty, even if they didn't even know that they broke the law. They were guilty of breaking God's law. Okay, aliens, people in the land, I didn't even know. Well, you're still guilty, but there is a there is a um, offering we can make for you for that unintentional sin. But what really jumped out to me was Numbers 15, and it says, but anyone who sins intentionally, whether native born or foreigner, blasphemes the Lord and must be cut off from the people of Israel because they have despised the Lord's word and broken his commands. They must surely be cut off their guilt remains on them. Wow, that's a bit terrifying. Like if you, like God knows I've willfully sinned even as a Christian and I have a testimony of that in a moment. Um, but this, this particular scripture in Numbers reminded me of Hebrews 6, okay? Where it says, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come through the Holy Spirit. They fall away to renew them again to repentance. Now we all know people fall away and come back to repentance, but this is just like a warning. Since they, are cru since they crucify again for themselves, the son of God and put him to open shame. So when we go on openly sinning, when we have been enlightened and know the word of God and, and received his grace, received his truth, and we willfully fall away, it says we're crucifying him over and over again. Can you imagine just literally you are the one shredding his skin and nailing those, those nails into his arms and his feet, you know, and, and just causing him just shame and public humiliation. That's what we do when we willfully sin as Christians, even, you know, so, and then, this then leads me to re thinking of the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In Job, Psalms, Proverbs, and Isaiah, we hear this. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Good understanding, a good understanding have all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. And so they're saying like when we have the fear of the Lord, it's our protection, it's our joy, it's our life. It's, it's, our, it's, um, it's, it's just... It's like an amazing treasure if we have the fear of the Lord because that fear of the Lord protects us. And I wanna give you a couple examples through my testimony. Uh, the, the one um, 
one time I was talking to somebody and they were telling me, kind of recounting my my sin and they weren't being mean, they weren't beating me up, they weren't in a wrong spirit, they were, <coughs> excuse me, they were frustrated with me and they, they were recounting my transgressions. And while they were recounting my transgressions, I was turned away. And every time they recounted a transgression of mine, a sin of mine, um, it was like I was getting the wind knocked out of me, like I was being hit in the stomach. And, and, and it was like, and I was weeping and I was having a hard time breathing. And it was like another one, <clears throat> another one. Ugh. And it just was hitting me in my gut every time my sin was recounted to me. And when they finished, I, I saw in my mind's eye and I saw a gavel come down and I heard, you're guilty. You deserve hell, even as a Christian, but I've given you mercy. And I, I never understood truly the, the extent and the depravity of my sin. I thought, well, God loves me. He's so forgiving. Uh, uh, he's just so patient. He's so good. That's all true. But th the reality is you don't go keep sinning. It's, it's grievous. It's, it's repulsive to him. And it creates an obstruction between us, the, how close I can get to him when I continue in sin. It, it, it's like shutting door after door after door. And I get further and further away from him when I have sin after sin after sin. And, and I get darker and darker and darker. And so the fear of the Lord lets me understand that he is holy and his laws are holy and they're there to protect us. And uh, another testimony was I had a really bad car accident and I was going through some really hard times and I was justifying my sin because of my hard times. And um, I had this car accident and I was driving 67 miles an hour and I heard an explosion and I, I was like, and my car just starts going out of control side to side. And I'm looking at my steering wheel and I'm, I'm saying, okay, don't overcorrect, don't brake, don't overcorrect. So I just let my car do its thing. It's just bouncing lane to lane. Next thing I know, it starts lifting side to side. And I hear, cover your head. And I'm like, okay. So I like just take my hands off the steering wheel at 67 miles an hour and just put my head in the crash position. And, and my, my car ends up flipping upside down and my head bashes out the window because my car landed on the driver's side upside down and my head's totally protected. My elbow hit, only, I only needed four stitches and then I landed right side up. But while I was in this situation, I was going, Jesus, help me, 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 Jesus. And when I landed right side up, because I only flipped once, hit on the driver's side, everything crashed, landed right side up and I heard Call on the name of the Lord and I'll save you, Old Testament to new. Jackie, you can look me in the eyes and walk backwards off the cliff and I won't stop you. Don't ride the fence. Now, I'm a one-year-old Christian. I'm going to the Seventh-day Adventist church and I've only been in the word for one year. I was not raised in the church. I didn't know much about the church. I was obviously new in the Bible. I was studying it like mad. I mean, I love the word. Always have, always will. Um, but I didn't understand what he was saying because I'm like, what do you mean? like? Call the name of the Lord, Old Testament to you, Old Testament to new, I'll save you. What do you mean, you know, look me in the eyes? I knew what he meant by that one. By that one, he said, you can tell me you love me all you want, but if you, if you continue in sin, you can look at me and tell me you love me, but you're still walking away from me, and I'm not going to stop you. You have, the, you have your free will to do that, even if it means destroying yourself. And I was like, and because I was very stubborn, I'm not so stubborn anymore, but that made me fall in love with God so much more to think, wow, he loves me so much. And he gives me the free choice to destroy myself. Although he's calling me, he's wooing me, he's giving me wisdom. He's saying, I love you, but if you love me, you got to come towards me, not walk away from me looking me in the eyes, right? So you can say everything you want, but if you're going in the other direction, it doesn't mean anything, right? And then the call my name Old Testament to new, what he was showing me was that in the Old Testament, when people are like, oh, well, God was so mean and he was this different God. Now Jesus is so nice and fluffy. No, that's not what's happening. It's in the Old Testament. It said it was a shadow of things to come because without Christ, and I'm giving you a very detailed synopsis, but hopefully it whets your appetite. In the Old Testament, you couldn't go into the Lord's presence without the shedding of blood because we were, we were sinners. We'd have to offer the blood of a dove or offer the blood of a goat or offer the blood of animals to go near him because we were reminded continually that we deserve to die but this holy god is giving us mercy through this blood right but there was a better way because that could never 
never change us, that could never redeem us. Okay, the Bible says the blood of goats and animals could never redeem us. We needed a better way, and it was a shadow, and it pointed to the, the perfect sacrifice of Christ, right? But the thing is, when we go before the Lord's presence, now in Christ, when we're born again, we say, okay, I receive your salvation. I receive your blood. I've, your blood has been sprinkled on that place. I walk in through your blood, and therefore I'm forgiven, and I can go before the Father, and I'm forgiven and cleansed. And pure okay but we go into God's presence so often after fighting with spouses or or you know being mad at the person driving and and we're going into his presence his holy presence and we would have to go kill an animal and pour out blood and yet we walk into church like oh well it's okay I was mad or oh well I'm human no like that could cost you like an innocent little animal like that that deserves death <laughs> you know so not trying to bum you out, but the Lord also showed me after that encounter where I flipped my car, he said, he showed me a vision of like a, a plantation style house, like a red brick two story with the white columns and pillars, like a, a country gone with the wind kind of a country house. And he said, do you see this house? And I said, yes. And he said, do you, do you see the fence around it? There was like a white picket fence, maybe two miles around the perimeter, uh, maybe three. And I said, yes. And he said, that fence is my law. You stay within my fence, I protect you. It's your protection, it's, it's wisdom. You have the freedom to go outside of that fence, but you, you open yourself up to much more danger and pot potentially death, right? Hurting yourself, hurting others. And so he said, my law isn't intended to control or to keep people having fun. My law is intended to protect them and lead them and give them safety and health and wisdom. So all that to be said, let's come back to the final point of, hey, look, um, we don't want to crucify Christ over and over again. We don't want to put him to shame and shame him, like as if he's exposed naked when we sin over and over again to our, uh, to our with our family or with our friends or to strangers? Are we misrepresenting God and crucifying him all over again and putting him to shame? It, you know, thank God that God's merciful and he's made a way and he's patient, and he's forgiveness and he's long suffering. But, you know, even though we have that forgiveness and that safety to come back again, to repent, I just, this just put the fear of God of me of, wow, back in the day, there would be no, I would be cast out because I chose to you know, yell at somebody in the freeway again, or I chose to misrepresent God again somewhere. I lied at work or I mis be be abused my kids or, or whatever it is, right? It's like, no, like there would be nothing left for me. So I don't want to take the forgiveness and the love and the blood of Christ lightly. I don't want to trample it underfoot. And and I, I just wanted to share this because I think some of us need to be convicted. When, when he says, draw near to me and I'll draw near to you, how do we draw near to him? We, we repent. We repent, John the Baptist, Jesus didn't just show up and go, hey guys, here I am, everybody cool, you wanna get healed? No, John the Baptist is like, hey, prepare the way. Kingdom of heaven is at hand, repent, repent. Now, some people repented when John the Baptist showed up, some people repented when they saw Jesus, some people repented when they saw miracles, some people repented when, when um, Jesus was crucified, some people repented when Jesus was resurrected, some people repented after he was taken up into heaven. We don't know when they're gonna repent, but We've got to walk in the fear of the Lord and understand the cost of willful sin and the damage it can do to our hearts. So God is merciful, God is good. Go to him, repent, be clean, and, and, and let's not put him to shame.